Okay, so we're going to open up the meeting of the State Board of Elections here on August 30th, 2021. I'm Peter Kosinski. I have Commissioner Kellner, Commissioner Spano, Commissioner Casal here with me. And we will begin today's meeting with the minutes from, I guess we have two sets of minutes. One is August 2nd, one's July 28th of this year. Is there any discussion or? I move adoption of uh, both minutes as drafted. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Those, those are adopted. We will now go on to unit updates, and we'll start with uh, Kristen Savitsky and Todd uh, Valentine. Well, first, we do welcome Kristen to our first full meeting <laughs> as co-executive director. Um, certainly has hit the ground running and has big shoes to fill, but I'm sure she was so far so good. <laughs> Uh, well, this month, you know, obviously we're focused on certifying the ballot. Uh, part of the minutes was one piece of that was the ballot proposals uh, that we have to certify. Um, we we're just finishing getting the translations and obviously speak more to that for the candidate layout. So those will go out uh, uh, on time. We're due to do that by September 8th. So we're looks like we're ready to get that ready to, on time and ready to go. Uh, we have been meeting on space planning, as was alluded to during the Public Campaign Finance Board. Uh, we're, we're actually taking, just to clarify, we've just talked about space planning in public finance, but it also impacts the rest of the agency. So as the plan currently is, um, as we currently have it, we have space on the fifth floor of the building. We have space on the first floor of the building. We're going to continue to have space on the first floor. We may get additional space to help us move temporarily while we're doing the renovations on site. Um, but either way, we're, we're going to permanently be on the first floor. We're, it may grow in size over time. We've also added uh, space on the 10th floor, which is uh, at this point, because of the configuration of the seats and the size, will just fit the enforcement unit. So they will be moving up to the 10th floor. We'll, we'll connect. Um, obviously, our network will connect them. We'll have to connect with them electronically to what they need to do. Uh, so that's also been part of the space planning. Uh, right now, what we have done is focused on the fifth floor to ensure that we have sufficient seating. So in total, um, the plans that we currently have will give us 158, uh, 158 seats on the floor. Uh, currently, we have 81 people currently. Um, that. You know, and I, we I understand that gives us room for growth for public financing, uh, and we also have identified this in the first of possible space, not this year or the next year because it still have to would have to be renovated for us. But um, so there's a little more room to grow in the building. So looking forward, it's good. It just is taking time, and part of that time is um, since we're not since we're dealing with an existing floor plan. We can't just gut the whole floor because there's nowhere for us to move. Uh, that was another problem. So we have to do it in sections, meaning that certain things have to stay where they are. For example, this boardroom will stay where it is. The law library next door will stay where it is. So we're planning around things that are, aren't going to move and adding additional offices to require space within the council that we've added, the directors. Uh, in addition to sufficient workstations for the additional employees we're expecting for public financing, and also IT to support them as well as uh, human resources. When, so when you move, when the uh, enforcement unit moves up to the 10th floor, right? is that before you do the renovation here? No, that will be step one or two. We are, we haven't, the next, next plan is once we finalize the basic layout, is who's going to go first? And most likely, it's going to be moving the enforcement unit yeah. up to the 10th floor. But there's renovations. Yeah. There's, there's some minor renovations that have to be done up there first, and electrical work that has to but bring doesn't that. Doesn't that change? You, you know, it gives you a vacancy now if you yeah, start right. your program. Sort of, because we're actually going to start doing construction right in that zone because we're leveraging some of the existing space to provide offices. We're using some of the walls to provide offices. So that's one of the first spots we're going to start construction once they exit it. So. Yes, it does, but no, it doesn't. Uh, so after we've done the, the basic plan, and we are almost we're almost done with that. We're still tweaking a few locations for a couple of extra workstations that they're in the right spot. Copiers are in the right spot, so they can give us a wiring plan. We expect the budget after that they'll do a, a more detailed plan, which will come back and give us a cost estimate. 
Um, they are reluctant to give us ballparks, but knowing the cost for floors that were fully gutted in this building previously, um, we expect the renovation somewhere to be in the $1.5 to $2 million range. That would include uh, new furniture, the wiring, the construction. You know, they'll detail that out. They're hoping it's closer to the $1.5 million. Uh, and as far as funding, you know, for this fiscal year, we are in a good position for that um, because of, uh, you know, obviously getting things started, there are funds that are available both in uh, enforcement can cover some of its own costs for, for non-personal service funds as well as some of the costs that we could attribute to the public campaign finance. Has, will not, they will not have been able to spend all their funds this year, so there's some funding available. And we do have funds available uh, if need be, although we'd rather not spend them first in the capital grant program because that would allow us to increase our infrastructure in a capital measure. So, And we've identified those to budget, and they said, well, give us the cost estimates and we can come back and see where it's coming because this project will span both this fiscal year and into the next fiscal year. So you know, their, their schedule that they, again, are reluctant to pin down on, this is OGS construction, is somewhere in the 30 to 30 week range. So what that doesn't include is problems that have arisen in the last year for furniture deliveries, furniture being the workstations, they're made of cloth and wood and they're different types of furniture. They're, they have experienced in other projects some delays in getting those, but they don't know how that's gonna impact us at this point until we go into the ordering process. So hopefully it doesn't delay us that much, but it could have an impact. It's a busy year. It, it's, and it goes into a busy year, so um, that's always been something we laid out to uh, uh, OGS and, and to pretty much budget anybody who listens. You know, we laid out an entire year's calendar of here's the events that occur month by month as you go through the election process for not just for ballot access, but also for campaign finance and the compliance unit when filings occur so they understand when we actually get physical documents. Because that's one of the things we do, um, you know, I wouldn't say the vestige, but it's how we operate is ballot access is a physical document that comes here. It's not electronic. The public campaign finance and and the, the current campaign finance for our campaign finance enforcement program always starts with some type of an original document. So there's always something original starts. So we have to have some availability for the public to come in and give us a physical document. Uh, so we will have a front window. We're going to move it a little bit. But so that makes it difficult because um, we're always going to need people here at certain points of the year on site to accept those physical documents to enter them into the system. Uh, we have proven, if nothing else, over the last two years that we are able to do some remote work. So we're not. We're not discounting it, but right now we're planning for the size we're getting right now for people we think we know we'll have on site. Um, what that next phase will be when public campaign finance is fully operational um, is still something that, that has to be considered as they go forward into that time period. And OGS is mindful of that. They don't want to build empty seats. Yeah. And we don't disagree with them, but we, we projected out we needed at least, you know, 100, and our, our goal was like 130 to 140 seats, they gave us 158, so that gave us a little buffer, um, at least over the next two years. After that, we're going to have to evaluate that if we go through it. Let me ask you the same question I asked Cheryl at the other meeting. Are we considering any remote situation? Because you don't have the training problem that she has. She has. Well, we con we consider it. I mean, our, our basic program is because of the, the artifacts that have to get filed here and the security means for being here, uh, we've always felt on-site work was the most effective for, um, again, for documents coming in. Um, you know, we don't have a, it would be hard for us to do an agency-wide program without somebody here on a regular basis. And what's coming into the mix is, I mean, the this will probably change, but the current plan was for all agencies to go back to fully in person uh, the first week in September. Now that is being reevaluated by the new governor, so we're not sure what's going to happen with that, and we have not received any additional guidance from them on that, other than we're reevaluating it. So, it, is it something to consider? We could do it. It was difficult 
doing it last year, but we got lucky because we were able to get the physical supplies for that. But then once you connect outside, that really increased our security risk posture um, because of the remote working and because the um, I was a petition people is very difficult because they need to work on their physical document or at least one that's on site. But for the campaign finance, they could do some reviews, but they still had to have access to a lot of the, um, the documents that are scanned in that aren't necessarily filed electronically. So it makes it challenging. And what's even going into the mix now is getting additional hardware is now proving to be a little more difficult than it was last year. Uh, that, that, all, that all sounds like it makes sense, but it doesn't make any sense. You, you're looking at things the way they are. I mean, every year, every month, things change very significantly. The, the types of, uh, of uh, machines that we have available to us, the type that, but the, I mean, in my own house, I mean, I just did something that didn't exist like four years ago, you know, I, that and, and improved something tremendously. But I had to research a lot of it and do it and keep my keep my ears open and my eyes open. Uh, and and I think it's illogical to say that this is the way we have to be. I'm not saying the way you should be is exactly the way you should be, but I don't think you can say this is the way we have to be. I know we don't disagree with that. Um, you know, and having talked with Bill Cross, you know what he's envisioning because right now our current structure is always designed to be on site. And we migrated to some of that to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. But that also, in order for somebody to remote work, you had to have something here to remote work from. So well, I understand that. So what he's looking at is, you know, and this is not this year, and it may not be next year, more likely the third year down the line, is to expand to more of a cloud-based computing that allows less tie to a physical infrastructure. But I got I to gotta deal with here and now. So for now, we've got a plan for that. But then he's also ha is looking towards the future so that we can ease up a little bit, if you want to say that, to allow for more remote work. But it's still something that, you know, to be honest, people are still evaluating how to work. And government's a little different than business. So, you know, it, it, yeah, I raised very good points. Listen, listen, I ran a government, and I had a lot of people doing remote work. And that was, you know, sure, that sure. was 10 years ago. Remote work, I've been a remote worker due to a lot of uh, family health issues that I have. And I found that actually I'm much more productive at home. Well, that's what a but, lot of but, corporations But you do have to, there are times where you physically have to be here mm -hmm. and have a place in the building. It just doesn't have to be as extensive as the one we currently have. We, you don't mind me having this conversation right now. <laughs> If you have someone that has to be here 10 hours a week or five hours a week, you can't maintain an office for that person or a workstation for that person. It could be a workstation for five of them that work that way and just dovetail their hours. You can't say to me, well, the law says we can't do that. Right. Well, then you go talk to some of the legislators and you, change, you get a law change. You know, my, and that's my point. It requires that kind of look at the situation. They had to talk to the union because if they trip at their home, it's that person comp, you know, that kind of stuff too. I've been through it all, so I, I can tell you about it. But it can be done, and it really diminishes the space. Uh, Cisco, big corporation, got rid of 50% of its real estate. I mean, you know, and they're still working. And, you know, it's a hit on government all the time when we have the attitude, you know, I know we're not a business. I know that. Forget about it. <laughs> um, but but we can do things a lot quicker, a lot better, a lot differently. You can reconfigure the way our digital stuff is around. We just did that. It took us 10 years. But it's, you know. Especially since the courts have now gone all electronic filing and the state courts and things like that. We don't have to run the paper up as much. And I'm not saying do it now. You can't even get a chip to do anything. That's true. Uh, that's true. I'm just saying, I just think that the head ought to be into it 24-7 as we work. I, I, what I've understand talking to Todd, and, and I'm sure they, they're thinking this way, but they're acting the way the law yeah, and the current administration is acting, mm -hmm. asking to act. 
Yeah. I'm reminded when Governor Al Smith proposed a new office building for Crossman Capital, they laughed at him and said, we'll never fill it with enough state yeah. workers. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I, I appreciate that and I understand that. But I like to make sure what I say is public. Make a good point. That's all. Okay, thank you. Kristen, over to you. Um, thank you. I first of all want to thank Todd and everyone for welcoming me. I've been here almost a month and it's been a great experience thus far. Um, we have done a lot to set up a cadence for meetings with the Department of Budget, meetings with OGS, meetings with Michael Johnson and enforcement. And I think that we're working very productively and uh, doing well together. We also both attended the virtual NYSED con conference. Um, and let's see, what else? I think Todd did a lot of it. I'm not going to uh, belabor by the report, but we're also attending the Election Commissioners Association conference beginning tonight uh, for two days this week and we will be presenting on redistricting and the staff will be presenting on recent and pending legislation and grants and absentee canvas reforms and election law and updated case law and um, it's been a pleasure thus far so thank you okay any questions no? all right and we'll move on to council Kim Galvin and Brian Quayle Thank you. Uh, we've prepared a lot of the di uh, documents that will be presented at the conference, including the legal update, the legislative update, lessons learned from CB22, um, continue to work on the parolee guidance that's due in early September. At first, I just thought it was uh, instructions for the person leaving the prison or the facility, but we also have to do uh, direct guidance to judges and OCA and things like that, so it's specific in nature. We should have that done any time, though. We met with es and S and the operations unit to go over the fixes that they have to the certification issues that were raised when they were before you for certification. The party threshold cases, the accessible absentee cases, and the uh, Western New York uh, absentee ballot illness cases, they're all moving forward. We've assisted the public financing with the regulations, specifically enforcement we've worked on. We've had meetings with uh, Mr. Johnson on how to clean up the lists and deal with some of the dormant committees, but I'm sure he'll speak to that. We've attended various other meetings with the units when requested to do so. Compliance, uh, compliance is a little bit underwater. Um, they're pulling double duty with a lot of the people that retired that were in the process of replacing. Some people have moved over to public financing. Uh, and the enforcement action has created a great stir of productive activity with treasurers and candidates and committees all calling saying, well, we thought we were done five years ago. <laughs> and we're like, well, you know, it's not that simple. So it's a lot of work, but it's good work, and we're looking in ways to, you know, clean clean those up as quickly as we thought. They are stunned, many of the callers. And um, uh, compliance and the rest of us also attend uh, meetings with IT on the software and the public-facing campus finest uh, applications. You breeze through with a sentence on meeting with ESNS about certification issues. Well, I thought that was uh, probably off. I was going to talk into it. But, but Nick and I did attend. They requested that people from the council's office be there as well. All right, we can wait. I'm patient. <laughs> I mean, there was just to add it, well, because I feel like we should re now. Um, there, was a, there was a lot of people there. They did a, they did a nice presentation. Um, I think there's going to be some follow-up. They is ES and S. Yeah, ES and S and their new lobbying folks. They did a they did a nice job. How long ago was that? Now three weeks. August 10th. August 10th. Do you want to talk about that now or when your report is due? I'm done. Minutes? Sorry. It's on my report, so we're yeah, let's wait for Tom's report if that's okay. Or this one. Okay. Brian, do you have anything to? Kim, you're done. I, am. I, I um, have very little um, to add. I would just note that we had um, 
for the uh, um, the July uh, periodic, we had 4,439 committees that had not filed, and um, in a very brief period of time, uh, 988 have have found reason to do so. Uh, still, leaves 3,451 out there uh, that um, that clearly are being worked on and examined. Um, but it is a it is it is a breath of fresh air. Well, we'll wait till. Um, Michael Johnson's report, but um, uh, I am interested uh, again in the procedures for closing down or writing off uh, committee. But maybe we should wait. To well, I, I just think we could. We did a, a few years ago before Mike started a dormant committee review with certain parameters and just went through and administratively terminated a lot of these committees. And what we're hearing from the staff is that many, many, many uh, over the years were in for one race. They didn't raise much money. They thought they were done. So we're, we're looking to work with Michael again and set some new parameters. We think we can get rid of, not rid of, but uh, close. Close, close down many, many committees that have just been sitting in the system for, for the past five years or so. And uh, the staff is working on the parameters now based upon the calls and what they're saying and that we're going to meet again and then do that run and close them out. What we do is we send the committee, we don't just, for anyone who's listening, we don't just terminate the committee, we correspond with the committee and say it's our understanding your committee is dormant. If you do not want us to close down your committee, reach out to us. And sometimes a few committees do, but for the most part, people are just relieved to have the defunct committee closed out and out of the system. I think from my experience, I've had a couple of calls from people on that first one. They thought they had filed their uh, discontinuance in one case. And I said, who's the treasurer? Said, my sister. I said, go talk to you. <laughs> you know, oh, but she, she thought she had and she had... I think a lot of it is just uh, unintentional and uh, Well, people don't realize, oversight. too, there's, there's certain steps that you have to execute in order to officially be terminated in the that's system. Right. So we're what, that's what I said when I said the uptick for the, right. the compliance uh, people has been substantial. That's what they're doing now. So many of those committees still not terminated yet, I believe, are you know in constant contact with staff now, trying to work through a lot of those issues. What happens to a committee? where the person isn't running, but there's a, a question about expenditures and so on. And now that committee's sitting there. And five okay. years out, some of them move longer than that. Well, there's a lot of committees that are many years old that have funds in them that are used lawfully. Um, I'm talking about funds that already have been used and we have big questions about. Well, if there was a complaint or something like that, or uh, if, we, if anyone wanted us to look into, we would delve deeper. But for now, we would just review the filings for what they are. Unless it says <coughs> unlawfully used funds, we probably aren't going to pick it up in a random review. But if there's a complaint or something like that. We I would imagine there's more to it. I would imagine there's going to be more. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. I, if anyone, now, if they're dead, it has to be closed within two years. Okay. We had a couple. We've had a few of those. And yeah, I know that. <laughs> and if they don't close it, we can close it Correct. for them and take their money. Correct. If there's any money in there. Okay. One of the problems that we found in this review was a lot of the old New York City campaign finance people that were audited and reviewed at their end and shut down their committee before we made it a like a single filing up here. Mm -hmm. These are a lot of the people over the past five years that the staff is dealing with too that ran in New York City. They were done with New York City. They thought they were done up here. So it's just a lot of moving parts, but uh, he has certainly sparked a great deal of activity yeah. out in the filing <laughs> world. So we're happy with that. Any more questions? Okay, thanks. We'll move on to election operations. Tom Conley, Brendan Lavella. Thank you, Commissioner. <clears throat> As Todd mentioned, we've been working on preparing the certification for the November general election. 
we received the ballot access filings from the judicial conventions. Uh, there is no prima facie determination for the commissioners to vote on because there were no objections made to any of the, the, the filings. Uh, and I believe at this point we do probably have all the materials that we need to send it out uh, between the Supreme Court uh, races in which we often do the layout for the board so they know how to place the names on the ballot. Um, and with the propositions, we have not just the written translations, but we also provide uh, audio recordings of the uh, of the propositions so that uh, we can use those kind of throughout the state, which uh, I believe John said they're ready to go. So we'll send out all the material to the county board so they have all the information that they need from us for the November term. Um, we've been collecting candidate notices from the county just to make sure they comply with all the various uh, sections of the statute. Um, we continue to receive and review all of the different plans that come into the state board for the early voting, uh, security plans and network checklist, uh, and the prevention for early re release of uh, voting results. Um, with regard to voting systems, as Kim mentioned, uh, yes and S uh, did come to the board on August 10th to have a discussion regarding the uh, discrepancies that were cited in the last testing report, um, which prevented the express vote XL from being certified. They made some of the changes. They wanted to show us some of their some of those changes and also discuss some of their thought process. Um, their plan is to, at least as was described to us, to us was to submit a whole new um, version of the software in the beginning of 2022 um, that would address seemingly address the the discrepancies that were like I, like I said cited in the report. One other thing that it would also address is it would um, run on a Windows 10 operating system, which I know a lot of people have been requesting. Um, the last version of their software that they had submitted still run, ran on uh, Windows 7, uh, which is end of life. But um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll see what comes of that. Um, we'll have to see what they actually submit. I imagine since it is going to be a whole new software release, it'll have to go through a whole new um, uh, you know, barrage of testing um, for the source code at the very least. Um, I think they were also looking at submitting another piece of hardware, one of their other models of their uh, central count scanners. They have the 450 and 850 they've submitted already. I believe they were going to submit a 650, which is kind of between the two. Um, Can I just sure. ask a few questions on that? So what, why were the lawyers brought in? I believe it was just a request from the, 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 the lobbyists for the company. They wanted to... I think ES and S got the crazy impression that sometimes the lawyers were the impediment to things moving forward. So I think they just wanted to present to everybody at one time. They just made a simple request and we obliged. And who were the lobbyists? Uh, Greenberg Trower, Hardy, and uh, Oppenheimer. Bob Hardy and Scott Oppenheimer. And, um, I, I monitor the Sunshine filings. Did you file your Sunshine reports? I did not. No, nor did I. I did not. <laughs> we had a, a failure of Sunshine. Um, uh, so, so I would appreciate that that be done in the future on a timely basis, so we know what's going on. That's why. The rule exists. Okay. Um, the um, uh, so uh, roughly, how much did ESNS pay for certification so far on the XL? Did, does anybody know? Um, I, I honestly, I don't have the number at the top of my head. It was, I believe, over a million dollars. Okay. And they would have to basically do that again. Then. Uh, leverage some. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, to the extent that they can lever or leverage any previous testing they would. It really depends on how much of the code base they are going to be changing, but it probably will be somewhat significant since they're moving to a newer operating system. Okay. I appreciate it. So, we, so we, at least uh, to the extent the public is concerned, we're not looking at uh, Excel certification until spring of 22 at the earliest. At the very, very earliest. If they're submitting it in the first quarter of 2022, I can't imagine it's going to okay. be done. Um, 
with regard to other voting machine vendors, we continue to have all of the conversations that we've been having. Um, some of the vendors are more active than others. Um, I know that at this point, I've, I've said in previous meetings that we've had conversations with Dominion, Heart, Intercivic, uh, Clear Ballot, and Democracy Live with regard to submitting new systems for certification testing. At this point, we've only received an application from Democracy Live, but we're still kind of in the early um, stages of that process, having conversations with them. They have not submitted any software or hardware for us to review. Um, we did have a conversation with Clearbout last week. Again, they have not submitted any kind of application, but uh, I think they've been asking a lot of questions about compliance with various aspects of, of law because I believe they're looking to um, make a significant amount of changes or a separate release just for New York before they actually submit it. Uh, operation staff also visited uh, Columbia, Chautauqua, and Catarabas counties. We're doing acceptance testing on new leading voter equipment. Uh, with regard to early uh, electronic public systems, we have been uh, working on the, the testing for the two submissions that we received from Knowing and from 10X. Uh, we did provide the testing reports to all the commissioners and a resolution um, for the adoption or for the approval of those configurations that were submitted is slated for later in, um, in the meeting. Uh, with regard to technology projects, we've been working with IT to improve and try to streamline the process by which we receive uh, contest and candidate information from the counties for their local contests. Um, one of the reasons being is that uh, the compliance unit needs it in the finest end of the system. The other being that there is a new law that went into effect last year that requires the state board to publish that information on our website. Uh, and so we've been trying to figure out how best to get that information out of the local systems, however they're keeping it, and in a way that we can then provide to the voters on our website and in an accessible manner. Uh, we've also been looking to finalize the process and the requirements by which a new voter registration vendor can be approved uh, for use by a county board. There is a resolution amending our regulations uh, also for later in the meeting. Uh, and we continue to be involved in the OVR and AVR projects with internal staff and external stakeholders. And Brendan and I are both evaluators and we're looking to attend an OGS kickoff meeting on September 13th about reviewing the, uh, the bids for the program for that project. With that said, I think that's all I have. Uh, okay. Brendan? Any other questions yes. for operations? So, so you haven't mentioned uh, the uh, investigation of the Westchester anomaly from the, uh, I mean, this is a long time pending now. Um, but, uh, you know, I wanted to indicate uh, publicly that uh, that the draft that I thought was submitted was uh, uh, lacking in any persuasive explanation um, uh, uh, and basically missing forensic evidence. Um, so that uh, I think it's important that uh, the operations unit uh, follow up on this, um, that uh, um, there is the possibility that there could be a problem with the machine that has not been uh, previously diagnosed, and by doing a proper investigation, we will gain greater confidence that the machines are working or that we can improve them to make them work better, um, or that the procedures at the Westchester board um, may need to be improved and that they are addressing those procedures. Uh, and then um, to, to go on further, that uh, I hope that uh, the presentation about uh, the 22nd Congressional District uh, issues will generate a discussion among the commissioners um, at the county commissioners as well as the state commissioners on how to improve the oversight on, uh, uh, of the um, county operations, which is difficult because the counties are pressed with limited resources and the operations unit has been doing an excellent job with respect to voting machine issues. Um, 
but has very limited resources in terms of uh, dealing with the county. And I think we need to address that and make the legislature aware of it. What do you, what are you suggesting? Well, um, uh, with respect to Westchester specifically is that uh, I, I personally reject the report as inadequate, that it just does not deal it, it does not provide an evidence-based ex explanation for the anomaly. Um, and that doesn't mean that there isn't a perfectly innocent explanation, but it is not done with uh, a proper uh, forensic analysis. Um, a good example would be what was done in Linden, New Hampshire earlier this year. Um, where they discovered that the uh, uh, number of ballots in their uh, audit uh, were significant, that the votes in the audit were significantly different. And so they brought in a team of investigators who determined that the scanners were counting the folds on the ballot uh, and that this uh, created anomalous results depending on the position of the ballot. Um, the, in, in Westchester, I mean, I could go through the report paragraph by paragraph, but the explanation does not flow logically. And it basically says, oh, trust us, it's okay, without any, um, critical analysis. Um, uh, ultimately, it may be go back to the ballots in those uh, EDs and rescan them uh, and see if they still match. Um, it, the report doesn't even review whether they whether any of the audits covered those four election districts. And I realize the odds are when you're doing a 3% audit that those districts may not have been addressed. And, and also the report suggests that the errors came from the scanning of the absentee and affidavit ballots. Um, and if that's the case, well, all I'm saying is to go back through it and do it logically. And I'm prepared to spend time going through it paragraph by paragraph to say, well, this doesn't flow from that. You guys went to Westchester, right? Oh, we did. You guys met with the commissioners, right? Yeah. Yes. What did you guys come away with? Well, they basically provided us, because we had gone down to have a meeting with them because subsequent to their letter that they submitted, or that they gave to County Legislator Marr explaining the issue, um, we had felt at that time that it didn't really clearly provide all the information that one needs. Uh, as I believe I mentioned at the last meeting, their explanation that they gave to us there was that the error itself was, was based um, of ballots being scanned under a header card for a different election district, but that the election district that received those ballots in error shared the same ballot styles as the one that same it should candidate. have been. Right, so that it should have been attributed to, so that it did not necessarily affect the outcome of any race or the results of any race, but rather the blanks and void votes that belonged in one election district were simply attributed to another one, which is why you saw some that had more than less uh, than what would be expected as far as the average for that um, for that county or in, in for any of the other contests. Uh, so they also, some of the other issues that they had raised was simply a matter of what they admitted being overwhelmed by some of the, the, the amount of paper uh, that they had to deal with and what they said it was constrictions with space, both for handling those ballots, but also for scanning um, those ballots uh, and the way that the whole thing was kind of set up because there's they're on different floors and they were just some people were bringing the ballots down to a different floor and that room where they were doing the scanning was very kind of cramped and had one small table set up in the middle of it and so uh, there was kind of multiple reasons why an issue could have occurred and not been caught. Um, there's also the issue with cross training that they that they needed to do more of even though they sh strove to. Um, do some of that, obviously, they were just kind of overwhelmed by, by their own admissions. But to the extent of getting to, to, to trying to get more additional information, 
been working with Brennan to try to come up with a list of some of the forensic information as far as just documentation on pre-election logic and actually testing on the equipment, any of the post-election audits on the central count because they should have done at least 3% of the districts. Um, they did mention in their letter that the audit did prove that the machines worked properly, but to your point, Doug, they did not state that whether or not any of these election districts were included in that audit. Um, so we were going to be asking them for all that information, any of the written procedures, and then a couple of narratives, both on how did they come to the conclusion that they, you know, conveyed to us at the meeting, um, which staff were involved in determining that, did they look at the ballot images, um, how did they verify that all the ballots were, you know, the votes were truly uh, tabulated correctly because of the, the similar ballot style. Um, and and that, that last question is the key question. You know, did, and they, did they go back and confirm that that explanation uh, is consistent? In other words, they say it didn't affect the results. Well, how do they know that? So we'll be, we're going to be requesting them formally uh, to provide all of that information to us. And then we'll amend and revamp the report. And, and I do accept that this does not affect the outcome of any contest. It is simply a matter of evaluating whether there is an issue with their procedures or machines that needs to be addressed. And um, in 2012, uh, uh, a review of uh, undervotes in the Bronx uh, disclosed a problem with uh, uh, the uh, that the machines, if the machines were not warmed up. They did not uh, pick up uh, the intensity of a, of a mark uh, so that uh, when they did logic and accuracy testing, they did not uh, pick up what effectively is a wrong calibration of the machine. And so the result is a large number of overvotes, I mean undervotes, and that Cause New York City to, and the SNF to change their procedures for um, uh, doing the logic and accuracy testing for the machines. And I'm just suggesting that when we see an anomaly like this, um, the anomaly is not just that these districts had a higher rate of uh, undervotes than adjacent districts, which is the fundamental thing that points this out. But Westchester County itself has almost double the rate of undervotes than uh, the rest of the state, and that there's no other county close to Westchester's number of under rate of undervotes. So that, again, just raises a question. Is there something about the Westchester procedure that leads to significantly more undervotes than in other counties. And I'll say that the answer could be very in. So in, you know, I tell the story of uh, Char Charles Stewart, who is a professor at uh, Harvard, who um, does uh, research on uh, an election data analysis, um, contacted us. Um, to indicate that uh, there must be a mistake in the um, New York uh, presidential votes because Orange County has seven times the rate of undervotes for president as uh, the rest of the state. And, um, and I said, yeah, I, I see that. That's something we should follow up on. So I called Sue Barron, who's the Orange County Commissioner, and I said, Sue, What's the story here? You know, uh, have, have you looked into this? And she says, Yes, I've looked into it. We, we know, and it's not just that Orange County is seven times the rest of the state. The overvotes come from just four election districts, where the rate of undervote for president is 40 percent, which is a phenomenally high number for president. But those four election districts were in curious Joel. And it turns out that uh, one of the rabbis was advising people not to vote for president. And um, 
So it was a perfectly rational um, and verifiable explanation for the large number of undervotes in Orange County. So I'm not suggesting that just because there are a, a large number of undervotes that something is wrong. It just calls for a more thorough investigation than to just say, oh, this is what it is. Tell me, you, are you going to send this in a written form to the county and say, you know, we have these questions, da 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 da? Yeah, it'll be a formal request for the itemized documentation. Why don't you show it to Commissioner Kellner and see if he wants to add something sure. to it? Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. Anything else for the operations unit? Any other questions? You guys are done? We are. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Then we'll move on to uh, NVRA PIO John Conklin. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, the public information office has remained busy since the last election. Uh, we've answered a lot of questions about uh, ballot props, campaign finance filings for governor candidates, uh, still some lingering questions about the primary, the July periodic report, and uh, how to run for various offices, including how to run as a write-in candidate. Uh, with regard to the ballot props, uh, we did get a quote from the New York Press Service to publish uh, five ballot props in various newspapers around the state as required by the statute uh, came in around $63,000 and change, uh, plus the uh, translation cost, which was another $2,300. Um, so we will proceed with that shortly. Um, as Tom said, we have the translations for the ballot props for the county boards and also got audio versions for the, the uh, ballot marking devices. Uh, for um, voters with special needs. Um, so the, uh, we also worked with the council's office on uh, the um, the updates for parolee restoration. Uh, John, let me let me stop there. Right. Let's go back to the so the newspapers are going to publish. Do they? Did we talk about the electronic publication? Oh, I'm sorry. The, that's right. That's right. I had a notice. I had a note here that I looked right past. So you did ask That's about here, John. I know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> good, good, Peter. <laughs> My apologies. Um, you had asked about whether uh, the individual newspapers included legal ads in their online publication. Most of them do if they have an online version. Only three of them charged extra for the online publication. It was about ninety dollars total for all three of them. It was like the Hamilton County Express, uh, the Staten Island Advance. Um, and uh, uh, El Diario, which is one of the Spanish language newspapers in New York City. So um, we will include that cost, and we'll probably pay that out of our pocket because um, the, the Office of General Services has informed us that they're only going to pay for things the statute requires, which we view as the imprint version of, of the ad. So for whatever yeah. extra cost there will be, since they're so minor, we can pay for that out of right. our pocket. Are we putting this online as well? Oh, it's already online. The five ballot proposals, that's a little further and down in my report. Uh, we will put the translations up um, right. where necessary. Now, now, in prior years, we have circulated the translations to organizations that could check on the translations before we commit to publishing. Has that been done? Uh, that has not been done. Um, I'd be happy to. In, in particular, um, uh, all deaf, the Asian American Legal Defense Fund has, from time to time, provided us with um, well-founded corrections. Um, I, I take it. I take it. There's nobody here who's capable of checking whether the translation. Well, we do have a new hire, um, Gabriella, who uh, probably could do at least the Spanish version. Um, I understand she speaks seven languages, but beyond Spanish, I don't know what the other six are. I don't believe it's a Bengali, Korean, or Chinese, so it would be Spanish. So we can okay. at least get well, that done. I, I, um, and we can provide, I mean, I New mean, York City. If you City, send me the translations, I'll forward them. But uh, uh, I think that. Uh, um, it avoids potential embarrassment because sometimes the translators are, um, make mistakes. And it reminds me. What languages do we translate into, John? Spanish, 
uh, Bengali, Chinese traditional, and Korean. So I'm I'm happy to do that question. Okay. So okay, I'm sorry, John, I interrupted you. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. So um, as I said, the uh, so the online versions will pay for whatever whatever the extra cost is. So um, we had worked with the council's office on uh, discussions with the Department of Corrections and uh, Community Supervision about the but the. Um, early restoration stuff. We're going through a range of call with the Sheriff's Association also. They're the ones who run the local um, uh, the local jails, so they're included in that legislation. Uh, so how does that work now as far as restoration of their rights? How does that work under the new statute? As soon as you're discharged from the facility, you can register. Automatically, even though you're on parole? Yes. So you don't have to no. complete parole anymore? No. Yeah, the, out of the facility. You do. So, so we have to be noticed? That they've been released. No, it's incumbent upon the office, the compliance officers or whoever at the facilities to provide them with the registration form and the instructions. Oh, I see. So they have to re-register. So the person exiting has to file a registration form. No, no, they just have to give them the form or. No, but I mean, I mean the person, the individual has to take that right. form and file it. Has file to be an it, affirmative, be re it has to be an affirmative registration. Gotcha. Gotcha. And if there's, if there's any question by the local board whether the person's on parole, they can look them up in the community supervision lookup. They'll Probably. See that well, as long as you're released, so so if somebody walks in my door, I don't have to check on their status. I know they walked in my door. Right. They've obviously right. been released. You can register to vote now. The problem is going to come with the revocations, and then they're re-incarcerated, uh, and you're not going to know if they they're voting can from be the, canceled or not. So they could be voting from the... Well, uh, presumably, if you get an absentee ballot for Thanksgiving, you wouldn't send it. But but, but there is one ad additional wrinkle. The the statute that set up the original uh, felon revocation process had OCA send us a list once a month of those who were sentenced to felony convictions. There's no list that we get from them saying these people have been released. So if they go and register at their local board, nice voter could still flag them as a felon and then the county board should then take the extra step of looking right. them up to say, oh, yes, they have been released, they're on parole, they're eligible to register. Yeah, they have to look at the parole we look up. So, because there, there was no additional amendment requiring OCA to issue another list or the Department of Corrections to issue another list to us. And judges have to notify people now at the time of their sentence that they will be forfeiting their right uh, to register to vote, but that it will be... Uh, Refunded is the wrong word, but reestablished upon their release from the custody. A lot of tricky words. So, if someone is incarcerated, they're released, they register, they get put back in, they come out, they've got to register again the second time they come out? When they get put back in, they should be canceled because we should be flagged for the okay. felony in the system. Okay, and how would we know that? How because, would the county know that? Because OCA sends us a list. When it's revoked? No, when they're when the felony Anybody is imposed, be. when they're sentenced. Right, but felony. when they're re, re we have no idea. When they recidivate. So the revocation, we have no, no knowledge like the, of. Like well, when the governor's office was sending the pardons, they would send us the list of parole revocation, pardon revocations. Okay. Right. Well, so, we, so which is essentially the same list, um, and, and we've raised that issue with um, uh, our colleagues in corrections to um, find out how we would be able to get that list. That list like being what? That list being the second list. So the, the revocation. The revocation. The, right. The reincarceration. The reincarceration. So what had happened previously is the governor was issuing um, these voting pardons um, pretty much, you know, per force um, automatically. But there were a few folks that didn't get them. And then when someone who um, had received one of these voting pardons went back into custody, the governor sent us a list of revocations, of pardon revocations. It's a very similar list that we still need. The, the issue now is, is just more binary. It's either you're in or you're out, but we need to know when you go back in. Um, so so we're, working on, we're working on that data stream, but the, the current data stream has never been perfect. So if someone, if someone is released, registered, gets revoked, they're back in, we don't catch it, they can apply for an absentee ballot? 
what? someone applying their theoretically, to them? Theoretically, if, the county sure. board wouldn't that, know. Still right. right, that would be true of anyone who should be um, should be canceled but wasn't. But the attribution is on the request that you're not incarcerated on a felony conviction. Right, so that's if part you, of that's if part of what you right. sign. Right? There is some protection there. If you, yeah. if you request to have your absentee ballot sent to Attica, that might be a red flag. Well, my Should thought be. was, what if what if they have it sent to their home address and a relative then transports it to the prison for them? I don't, I don't think we have any way to catch that. No. And, then, and the county jail is now an eligible address too, because you can be waiting mm -hmm. trial right. on a sentencing, or you can be less than a felony in the county jail and serving your time there, and you would you would be eligible for an absentee the ballot county at that jail location. Is, the county jail has actually very few people that would even qualify upon their release. And it's it's a similar issue to when someone has moved and they may be voting from an address that they don't actually live at. The system has never been um, completely perfect, and, but for all of the disqualifications that do exist, we have the most robust infrastructure for right. this particular disqualification. Compared to okay. any other. Hmm. Thank you. So uh, the unit did 126 foils in July. Um, we continue to be part of the ABR OBR conversations and meetings. Um, we continue to have. Uh, weekly meetings with IT and compliance on the public reporting page. Um, and for the website, uh, as mentioned a few minutes ago, we did publish the five uh, ballot props uh, on the website. Um, we updated the home page by removing a number of things that were stale. The 2020 elections box was completely removed. Um, and most of the things that were in there have been either somewhere else on the website or you can get by asking for them. Um, so we added a pull-down menu on the left side under campaign finance. Uh, so you can go either to the main campaign finance page or directly to the public reporting page without having to go through two other clicks to get to the public reporting page. Um, and lastly, we posted the webcast for the July 28th and August 2nd. Uh, meeting. So, um, Cheryl, do you want to uh, add anything? Well, simply that our team will be presenting a grant to Mr. Kim's presentation on um, September 1st to the Election Commission Association. That's Wednesday morning. So, that's my report. Any questions? No? Okay, thank you. We'll move on to ITU and Bill Cross. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, I'll start with projects. Particularly campus fitus, we continue to make numerous updates and improvements to that system. Uh, and as John indicated, we have internal uh, meetings at least weekly with representative groups uh, for that system, and we are uh, staying to our committed bi weekly release schedule. Uh, and also incorporating user feedback we received, as well as continuing to work with Microsoft on system improvements. Uh, for online voter registration and automatic voter registration, as I believe was already previously mentioned, the RFP uh, deadline was uh, Friday. Uh, as we were notified this morning by the Office of General Services, we have received four responses to that RFP. Uh, they still need to be evaluated for minimum qualifications. Uh, and SBOE, SB, oh, <laughs> SB, SBOE, uh, thank you. Uh, we will receive them on September 13th, as Tom indicated, when they go through uh, their uh, process for, re for receipt and their training for evaluating, although the team has already done those evaluations previously. Um, last week, we provided a project update uh, to Chamber, legislative members, budget, state comptroller, Office of General Services, and state IT uh, regarding uh, the project scope, the budget, um, the timeline, um, several other aspects of the project as a, as a general over, overarching update. Uh, we are also continuing to plan county board outreach sessions for OVR, ABR. Um, these were to be in person, they will now be virtual. Um, we are currently uh, determining what that agenda will look like and the timing for that, but we, we, in, we expect that there will be probably four sessions over the course of two weeks. Um, the absentee ballot portal, request portal, uh, we can 
continue to receive process uh, requests, continue to process requests through there. Uh, currently, approximately 2,400 since its re-implementation, uh, and we are currently looking into the new tracking requirements around uh, absentee ballot requests, uh, and we'll be working with vendors and county uh, and county boards um, to determine what uh, data elements need to be exchanged between uh, counties and the state board for that tracking. We also continue working with the team of executives and admin on space planning needs for the agency. Uh, as I believe was indicated in the previous uh, board for public campaign finance, IT is working with public campaign finance management and interviewing project positions, as well as the review of uh, Connecticut's program earlier this month. Uh, for security, I'm happy to announce we filled the Chief Information Security Officer position. Ben Spear will serve as the Director of the Secure Election Center. He possesses a map of public administration and is the former Director of the National Elections Infrastructure, ISAC, or Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Um, cyber regulations, with the publication of the cyber regulations at the last meeting, we've created a reporting tool uh, for the counties uh, to facilitate submission uh, to the state board. We also continue to work with the New York State Local Information Technology Directors Association, or NICE GLIDA, uh, that represents IT directors and, and CIOs for the counties to cover topics of that regulation uh, and will be presenting at their fall conference in October, as well as a we will cover it as part of our update at the EPA conference on Wednesday. I'm also happy to report we worked with uh, Office of General Services and Division of Budget to successfully renew the security systems that we put in place for the counties uh, three years ago, intrusion detection and security monitoring. Those are now being renewed for an additional two years. Uh, we also continue to work with NYSTEC and numerous counties on the implementation of their risk remediation plans um, and are, are reviewing uh, reimbursements for those efforts. We work, have worked with uh, operations on the uh, voter registration and system standards. Um, we continue to work with SUNY Center for Technology and Government on the future of elections infrastructure project. Um, we will We'll be working with them to finalize a report for that project in the very near future. Uh, and as always, can we continue working on multiple security improvements to our own infrastructure. Uh, we are also currently in the process of acquiring uh, new equipment for a refresh for our own environment here for uh, servers and stores, et cetera, as, as Todd mentioned. Uh, we have to address Commissioner Spano's comments previously, part of, part of that uh, specifications for that, for that infrastructure that we're purchasing will be to accommodate uh, greater uh, remote access uh, through that, so we have the capability to do so more efficiently. Um, so the website, uh, we've basically returned to normal levels following the June primary, approximately 120,000 page views per month for June and uh, July and August. You're done? I am. <laughs> Are there any questions for Bill? I just say, Bill, I know you've got a lot on your plate. You always seem to, I think the whole agency revolves around you now. And so, uh, you know, uh, do you have enough, I mean, from a staffing standpoint, what's your, what's your current staffing level? Um, with permanence, we rely, I'm about 50-50 split between permanent positions and contractors. We rely heavily on contractors. Okay. It's not my preference, but we do, and we actually have fairly good ones. Um, all together now, um, still, although I have a few vacancies still, we're high 30s and covering it. We should have around 42 yeah. with the new OVR, ABR, we're adding four additional, um, two of each space. And Continue. We've actually had better luck uh, recently with filling some of those positions than we had in the past, and we certainly struggled initially with the county side of trying to get people into those positions. Uh, um, 
and, and, and took quite a while. We had, we have had discussions and we fell in positions of, of late fell. Particularly though, most of them have been contractors which are easier to fill but come with their own set of issues in terms of continuity uh, of, of knowledge and things like that. The, the use of contractors, is that based mostly on the fact that you can't fill positions or that you don't have positions? Uh, both. A little of both. It's, it's difficult to get permanent positions uh, classified and filled and funded two minutes going forward. Um, the contractors are more NPS or services. They come out of additional budget as, as well. We can fill them uh, a little. Uh, it's a little easier to fill them. Do these people work remote, your contractors, or are they in office contractors? They are, they are currently in office. They have worked remote when we went remote before. Um, where, when we were, went through uh, what we did previously, uh, many of them worked remote. Some obviously still need to be hands-on equipment, still here in, in many locations. Um, but where at all possible, we did utilize remote for them. From a cost-benefit situation, uh, would you prefer more in-house people than contractors, and would that be less costly than and accomplish the same thing than having the what you have right now? We do pay more for the contractors. Um, you know, part of that is also the benefits that we would not pay in the right. state, uh, although it does tend to be more. It depends on the position. Some of it, it, it in most cases, it's more expensive for the contractors, uh, but that's not always the case. Uh, the state, in terms of what they have what's called HBIS or hourly IT contracts. Uh, their new contract, actually the rates actually went down for them. Uh, then we were paying more under the previous contract for them. Um, so they're a little more expensive. I would always prefer uh, permanent positions um, because the contractors are a maximum of 30 months that I can get them for. And if we're on a longer term project such as OBR, ABR, things along those lines. Um, then we are in a position that that 30 months there is not a renewal process available. We have to go back out for an order. Now that same contractor may show up on our list again or may not. Um, but we are losing that knowledge, the knowledge transfer in the process, which is difficult, uh, particularly when you have something that's specific to, to the system. What about flexibility and change orders? Uh, for project-wise? Yeah, project you, you, hire, you hire, you get a contract, you get a contractor in, you hire him for this, this, and this. Yes. Then you look at it and you say, but now I need this, a little of this, they charge you more, correct? Um, no, we usually, it's usually by title, and we can utilize them, of course, the project if, if need be that way. Uh -huh. um, it is at our discretion, though, if we find that that particular title or person is not needed. So the contractor is a title. It, it's, not a title. Pro, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, well, they, we, we hire them in, in a certain title, and we assign them to a project, but we have flexibility okay. of not I was thinking of the project one. itself. And yeah, no, so these are, hired, these are hourly based contracts. Okay. Uh, state does have a process for what's called PBIS, or project based IT, yeah. and that works that way. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, then we'll move on to uh, Michael Johnson, enforcement. And, 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 and I note you gave us a report today, Michael. And, and, and I first of all, I want to thank you for providing that report because I believe this is the first report we've received like this from the enforcement unit. So I'm interested in hearing your comments. It's a pleasure seeing you. It's a pleasure seeing you. Um, so go ahead. You know, the, I gave you guys a breakdown of the, of the monthly statistics of July in terms of emails received, calls received, things of that nature. But the big issue that we've worked on with regard to the enforcement unit dealt with the non-filer letters. Now, as far as the data is concerned with regard to the non-filer letters, we got a list from, from compliance, and the list that we got contained 4,439 committees that were on that non-filer list. On that list, 4,067 committees had an email address listed, and we sent an email to those committees in lieu of the certified letter. And that was done basically because in the interest of time, 
to get a certified letter out was, was physically impossible. So I made the determination that the best way to actually reach out to these non-filers in the quickest way was via email, and that's what we used. We sent an email. Out of those emails that we sent, those 4,067 emails that we sent, 479 emails were bounced back for bad email addresses. Out of the letters, we wound up mailing a total of 854 letters. And I got to thank Todd for his help in getting those letters out because we were able to, you know, find a way to get them out first class. So we did that. Now, those letters that were mailed, those included committees that didn't have an email address and a non-filer list, and the bounce back email that has bad email addresses. Of those letters, which we made a present and given to you guys, we got back 108 letters that were returned undeliverable. And various reasons included bad addresses, no such building, no such number, vacant and forwarding mail, time expired to name a few. And we still have a few more letters to get Great. to you guys. Um, we, received, we received a voluminous amount of telephone calls. Um, I have on this 148, but I, I, I know that number was, was much, much bigger. Um, we received seven emails, although the emails we sent out said no reply, we received replies. So we, and I think we, I don't know if we forwarded it to you guys or not, we also got many letters where they actually sent us the letters in terms of, hey, here's my filing, and they sent us to us, which we passed on to you guys. In looking at the letter, we discovered quite a few anomalies, which we actually wound up talking with you guys. And one of the things we found out is candidates who didn't have or didn't file a CFO3, you know, for an authorized committee, or candidates who were not associated with a multi-candidate committee where a CF16 was filed, they were not on this list. So even though I say this number is 4,439, I honestly don't really know what that universe is in terms of the non-filer. Now, Kim touched on earlier us needing to close committees. Based on this, there are a host of committees that really should be closed, that have been dormant for years. And as a result of this, a lot of them had no idea they needed to file. A lot of the committees thought, well, my treasurer was taking care of everything, and I've not heard from the treasurer in five years. So a lot of people just assumed their responsibility was done. So what now is tasked in terms of the enforcement unit is trying to come up with a criteria with, with, with Kim and Brian, how are we going to administratively close a lot of these committees? Now, if you're a candidate or your committee and you can show me you've got a zero balance, okay, fine, you can administratively close it. But if you've got, even if you've got a negative balance, I'm going to, you know, assume there's probably some sort of bookkeeping error somewhere. Where the issue comes into play is where I've got a committee that's got a balance of six, ten thousand dollars, and neither the candidate has any idea where there, why there is a balance, and they've not talked with their treasurer in five or six years and maybe they can't even get hold of the treasurer. So now it's up to me to try to figure out what criteria am I going to use to close an account. Now, if you ask me to close your committee and I'm looking through it and all of a sudden I happen to notice, okay, maybe there are a few things that should have been filed on a different schedule, but, you know, that can be dealt with in terms of you fixing it. That's one thing. But then when I come into a situation like Commissioner Spano pointed out, where there are issues in terms of why am I seeing repayments going out, saying for loans, but I don't, you don't show any loans coming in. Those are things that make it really hard. Now I can't just simply administratively close that account, and you are going to unfortunately have to either A, get in touch with your treasurer to figure out what happened, or B, you're going to have to go out and hire someone to do some sort of forensic analysis to figure out what the issues are. 
So right now, this, I mean, this has been great in terms of us getting the letters out and things like that, but it's also opened up a whole issue in terms of making people realize you've got committees out here. You have a responsibility that they either need to A, be closed, or B, you need to make these files. And to the extent that I'm willing to be fair with any and everyone to help them, you know, clean up their committees, I can't just administratively close committees that I know there are issues. And so right now, that's the biggest thing that we in, in, in the enforcement unit are dealing with. I mean, we're moving to the 10th floor, which is great and wonderful. We're, I'm looking at bringing on new staff because the people are there, who are there have gone above and beyond in trying to figure out how to handle a lot of these issues that they've never had to deal with before or never saw before for that matter. So it's, it's, it's new and it's interesting for them even. And as far as, you know, the other issues and concerns, you know, we're still working on cases. Um, any issues with regard to cases, I'm more than willing to discuss in executive session for you guys. But right now, the biggest thing on our plate is the non-filer information and, and making a determination to go after them. And we have another filing in October. So I'm making certain, for instance, that we're on Wednesday, I'm having a meeting with Pitney Bowes to figure out what's the best scenario for us in terms of getting the letters out and getting the volume of letters out that we have on a certified basis. I reached out to OGS. They don't mail out certified letters, so they've recommended the post office, but we've actually reached out to the post office, and that's going to require one of us to physically be there to put the, the, the labels on and everything else, which we might as well figure out what we can do with Pitney Bowes. So that's where things stand right now. Good report. Well, I appreciate that. You've got a lot of work, I suspect, since very nothing, I should say, was done with this for five years. So I'm suspecting there's a lot of backlog that you're having to deal with. I mean, how far back, are you going back into the filings that were not made over the last five years that were ignored by the previous enforcement council, or are you just trying to cope with what you have in front of you you know, since the July report that came in this year? Well, uh, for instance, as I was looking at one of the non-filers on the list who were talking about they didn't make filings from, what, 2014, 2015. So I'm going that far back to try to figure out with this particular individual, here are your issues. You've got a large enough balance that I fundamentally just can't administratively close. I understand you're not talking with your treasurer. I understand you may not know where your treasurer is, but you have a responsibility to either A, make the filings, B, incur a substantial penalty, or B, I'm more than willing to work with you to try to come to some sort of middle ground or agreement so we could actually close this because it's to your benefit to close it, and honestly, it's to our benefit. I don't want to keep sending you non filing letters. So, I mean, in some cases, yes, I'm going back three, four, five years. It just depends on how, I mean, since this non-filer list has just it's been generated and we've sent the letters out, I guess this is the first time in a long time that it's been done. That's how far back I'm looking. Mm -hmm. I presume you're dealing with a lot of non-office holders, people that ran laws. Exactly. And that's and unfortunately what you find is those people who have run in a past that maybe didn't win or who decided to just give up after they've, you know, they've decided to retire, to them there's really no there's no impetus to file. So trying to explain to them what the filing is and why you have to file, you know, it's it's it can be a, an interesting conversation. Then you run into situations where the treasurer may have passed, which if that's the case, then I'm going to be a little bit more sensitive to that and figure out, okay, if you can't get in touch with your treasurer or if your treasurer is deceased, let's figure out a way to work this out. Or if the candidate is deceased, 
Well, at that point, then, yeah, let's see what it is. And if the treasurer is saying he did his best, then we'll administratively close it, like what we recently did. So that's sort of how I'm approaching things right now. Any other questions for Michael? Mm -hmm. I, I, if I may, I actually left something off my list. One of my other oh, sure. pieces for CAP is to reach that work with Michael with those requirements for enforcement. Um, we attended we previously as a CAP. Right. Um, you guys did mention that, and you're more than you know, gracious to say, hey, let's work out and figure out what we need. We're rebooting that. Up. Right. Just, uh, just uh, it says money collected, and you have. Just three hundred seventy dollars. Yeah, that's that's the number that I, I got from them because I'm trying to find out. You know, there's got to be more than this. That's why I'm asking. But you. this is the number that they provided to me, and, and it's the result of I'm still looking through things. Is that, that just this month, though? No. Oh, oh, because so no. you have a lot more money collected yeah. than that. Okay. Yeah, we have a lot more collected than that, but that. The number they have, I'm sure that number is definitely much bigger. It's just a, a question of saying, okay, let's look in places we've not looked at before to get a real number. Because, like I said, since this, um, since last month, since July, yes, more money has come in, and that was one of the reasons why we were able to I'm, have. I'm surprised at this one because I think John Calandra has been dead for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, and again, that's sort of that's what I mean in terms of a lot of these committees where you have people who have been deceased, and for whatever reason, these committees have not been terminated. And that's sort of what I'd like to really start doing because there are a lot of committees, especially committees on the list, that shouldn't have been there. Are you able? Are you, Michael? Are you able to distinguish currently between those kind of um, inactive, dormant entities? As opposed to existing committees, we know are still active. We know people are still around, and just aren't filing. Can you just, or do you have to go through the case by case, check every one of them? What I do right now is, you know, the people who are there, I will sort of in tranches say, okay, I need you guys to look at these. You know, give them sections of committees just to quickly look through. And after a while, you can see, you know, if there's been no activity for four or five years, then I would ask, okay, who is that candidate? Who's the treasurer? You know, we do our due diligence to find out, is this candidate still politically active or have they opened other committees? Those are the things that do we do. you do the same, uh, make, take the same approach towards county committees, town committees, village committees that have been formed over the years? If they haven't made their filings, yes. They get the Dunning letters as well. Yes, as long as they're on our, as long as they're on the no filer list. Yes, and that's sort of you know we're working. One, another line of demarcation too is uh, the committees were were never required to give you an email address until the new system came out. So those without email addresses are really really old compared to the ones that when they bounce back, we have people searching and clients running them down, getting updated emails to provide them. So. There are little things like that that you can differentiate the age. I should know this one. We still require them to file both the treasurer and an assistant treasurer? No, I think it's just the treasurer. Maybe I'm oh, I think I think I'm confusing with the federal requires that. Yeah. Well, somebody we, requires it both. So there's never an excuse when the treasurer is absent. Well, they passed a law recently where you can replace your treasurer. Right. Oh, is that? Yeah, yeah you can. That doesn't yeah, we just for a long time. And, you know, we run into situations where a treasurer thought they resigned, but they did not. So then that requires the candidate to actually reach out to the treasurer to say, you didn't resign. And, and based on my experience, that turns into a whole nother issue in terms of who wants to talk to who and who's not talking to who and who's accepting responsibility. So those are the things that, that I'm running into. Yeah, he's also going to run into a new treasurer wanting to take over an old committee for a treasurer you can't find because the new people don't want to get tattled with all those old filings not knowing what's in it or that haven't been made. So it's a whole host of bunch. Exactly. Where I, I've had a treasurer who will say, I'm the new treasurer.
treasurer, but how do you make it so that I'm not responsible for all the old files? So those are things that you kind of have to. The job were easier if I'd be doing that, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I appreciate your efforts. Um, you know, we've waited a long time to have somebody actually take an interest in this again. I'm uh, glad you're doing that because I think it's an important process that needs to be done here. And I think having failures to file is uh, as bad as it gets in campaign finance. And we've had a long time of failures to file around here with absolutely no follow-up. So I appreciate you doing what you're doing. Great. Anything else? No, I just, I, you know, just reiterate what you said. I mean, this, this was bad for us and for the people that didn't file. Especially the ones that, you know, made a mistake or something like that. Could have been corrected a long time ago if somebody was doing it. Oh, absolutely. No, the longer it lingered, the harder it's going to be to rectify. No question about it. I mean, I'd listen, it's bad for the public who didn't have any idea what these people were doing or these campaigns were doing because the filings just weren't made. And uh, that's shameful. And this, so, is like, this is like the squeegee issue. If you don't take care of it, other things happen. <laughs> well, it's bad. And I, I mean, this is really important to me because I think, uh, you know, Failure to file is just a total what? disregard for the law. I mean, that's as bad as it gets. You're just not even trying, apparently, to comply. You know, if you make a filing with some mistakes on it, at least you tried. Right. These guys aren't even trying. And well, as one person said to me, well, but if no one ever told me I was supposed to, and I'm not running for office anymore, and I stopped filing and stopped hearing from my treasurer, well, that's true. If you're a candidate and you haven't heard from anybody in five years, you can reasonably conclude that you, you're, you're done. Right, and, and his answer was, it's, as far as he was concerned, the onus was on the Board of Elections to let him know he didn't make his well, filing. Well, that's I a little... I don't know how yeah, he got it there, yeah, but... Yeah, yeah, well, people like to ship blame. Right. Um, okay, good. Anything else? Michael, do you have anything else? No, that was it. Okay. That's good. All right. Um, so if that's it, that's all the reports from our uh, staff, and we can move on to old business. Is there any old business? I don't have any listed. Anybody have any old business? I guess not. We want a new business, and under new business, we do have some items, and first one is the regulation uh, per, per 6217, County Voter Registration Systems. I'll go back to Tom and Brandon, I think you have any... Sure. Yeah, go through this for a minute so you can. So 6217.3 allows the State Board of Elections to approve any county's voter registration system before it can connect to the statewide voter database, my finger. Um, that regulation was um, put in place back when Nice Voter was first stood up when we were first integrating uh, that system with the, the, the county voter registration systems that were in place, which seem to be the ones that are still in place. Um, with there being interest in new vendors to coming in to, oh, okay. Time's up. sorry, Time's up. Uh, with new vendors having interest in, in bringing their software uh, into the state, uh, and also the fact, like I said, these regulations are, are somewhat outdated or at least old. Um, technology has certainly changed, and we took it as an opportunity to uh, look back at the, the requirements that are put on those county voter registration systems themselves. Uh, previously, the requirements that they were um, to comply with under 6217.3 were largely uh, focused around just the ability to communicate with NICE voter itself. Um, what we did was we kind of expanded those requirements to three different uh, areas. There's the functional area, just to kind of make sure that the voter registration systems allow the county boards to do all of the things that are required of them under law. Uh, the second is uh, the technical aspects of the communication, which was the original set of requirements. And lastly, uh, but certainly not least, was the uh, security requirements around voter registration systems themselves, uh, especially as we start looking at some potential vendors that are looking to host some of the data in the cloud, uh, whereas now we're looking at, uh, we've always just dealt with locally uh, hosted systems. So we've been working with NYSTEC and with IT and the Secure Election Center and OPS to come up with a new set of requirements that will apply to both new vendors and also to the existing vendors. Uh, the changes to the regulation kind of memorialize uh, the kind of the little, uh, the somewhat expansion of the, the requirements into those three different categories and also allows the state board to set uh, a time frame 
for any of the existing systems that might have to come into compliance with some of the newer requirements. Uh, so this way, all of those different voter registration systems will be on the same playing field uh, within a given amount of time that we get to that. How many vendors do we have now? Uh, at the moment, we, we have three counties that have built their own systems. There are 50 counties that uh, rely on the NTS system. I believe there are four counties that use the ESNS mega profile system, and then the five boroughs of New York City use the N tier system. So we have a lot of, well, well not I, that many. I usually really say for the 62 counties, we're happy to only have to deal with six different systems. Six, okay. Six. But, um, but yes, I think Schoharie is moving from their homegrown system, but they're looking to move onto NTS. Um, but I do know that there are a number of counties that have expressed interest in some of the newer vendors um, who are looking to kind of bring their software into the state. Any questions on this? Is there any interest, a motion, or any more discussion? We want to move in a second, and all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And we're done with that. Then we'll, we have another resolution. This is uh, 2115. And this is regarding electronic full books. I'll leave us back to you. Yeah, so as I mentioned. Do you want Brendan to do this one? <laughs> you. No, it's up to you guys. Okay. Just... Um, as I mentioned during our unit meeting, um, our unit report, we received two submissions from our e book vendors one from 10X and one from Knowing. The one from Knowing was just uh, updating the underlying iOS system for their Apple iPads. Uh, the 10X was an application update itself. Uh, we received the software. We did the testing in those environments with the help of testing from our IT unit, and we provided you with those testing reports as we tend to do. Uh, it is our uh, our recommendation that the commissioners approve those configurations. Uh, in the resolution, the counties who use those systems have the option of either updating immediately, um, or they if they don't, because sometimes logistically it's just kind of difficult to update all of the different iPads and get them rolled out in time before the election. Um, if they choose to continue to use the existing configuration, they can do so, but then they would have to update their um, their systems before they use those iPads in the next election. Okay, any questions? Is there a motion? Anybody? So moved. Second. So moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Good to go. That ends the new business. Uh, executive session, I don't believe is necessary, to the best no. of my knowledge. So I believe that concludes the meeting, unless someone else wants to bring something up that they thought of while I was talking. <laughs> no, if not, I'll, I'll, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So move, so Second, move. Uh, all in favor, aye. Aye, aye, aye. And we will meet again on oh, it October, October 4th. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Todd and I have a suggestion.